Okay, in this video, we are one week out from the AP Calculus exam, and these are some of the things that my students are still messing up. Uh, let's take a look. So first up, uh, given a graph of the first derivative, uh, some people are still struggling to identify points of inflection. So what I've done here is uh, circled the, x, the points on the graph where the points of inflection are occurring for f of x. And uh, my justification would be f of x has points of inflection at negative 3, 1, and 3. And that's because f prime has relative extrema at those x coordinates. And you don't have to think about it any more than that. Let's look at the next one, which is another graph of this. So this one's a little bit trickier. Uh, the graph of f prime shown above. For what values of x does f of x have a point of inflection? And we want to justify. So in this case, again, we're looking for relative extrema. Um, so my reasoning uh, at 4 and 6, because f prime has relative extrema at those x coordinates, uh, there's a couple of like tricky or like false points here, maybe. Uh, you can see here, it's like uh, going from a, uh, if f prime has zero slope and then positive, that's not a change uh, from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Uh, you can see that other one at negative one, you're going from increasing to increasing a different way. Uh, at two, you're going from increasing to just uh, horizontal. And then again, at three, you're going from horizontal to increasing. We need increasing to decreasing, which is why I like to use relative extrema as my justification. So that's something that people are messing up a little. Uh, the function f continuous on the interval from a to b. Uh, right Riemann sum is uh, man, this is a this is a mouthful. Right Riemann sum approximation for the integral from a to b of f of x dx using n sub intervals of equal length is given by the sum from one to n f uh, of x sub k delta x. A real problem would define those things a little better, but it doesn't matter for this purpose. We just get that that summation works out to 3, the quantity n plus 4, quantity 4n squared plus 3, all over 2n cubed for all n. What is the exact value of the integral? So they're telling you that the Riemann sum, if you could somehow work it out, is that like quantity there, 3n plus 4, blah, blah, blah. Just take the limit of that thing, right? So we just set this up. The limit of a Riemann sum is the definite integral. So they're telling you what the Riemann sum is. Take the limit. That's all you got to do. Uh, you should also note and not be afraid. They're not going to make you work this out. They're just going to give it to you. Um, there is an alternative type of problem that we just haven't done a lot of, uh, and not a lot of examples exist, where uh, they give you kind of the, the Riemann sum. I have a different video on that if you want to search it up. Uh, they give you kind of the expanded Riemann sum, and they ask you what is the definite integral. Um, I think you should check that out as well. It's a good thing to look at. Next up, which of the following functions has one horizontal asymptote and one vertical asymptote? So basically, it's like identifying horizontal and vertical asymptotes are the problem. Uh, so I'm going to look at each of these. The first one, I'm going to uh, deal with that denominator. I'm going to end up factoring out uh, x squared from a radical. Uh, square root of x squared is going to be the absolute value of x, and that is x when x is greater than or equal to zero, and the opposite of x when x is less than zero. That's important because we can rewrite this f of x. When x is greater than or equal to zero, we can write it as 3x over x radical thing. And then if we take the limit, you can see those x's are just going to cancel, and you have basically like 3 over kind of just 1. Uh, so the limit as you go to infinity will just be 3, right? Cancel those x's. 3 is the numerator. The denominator clearly just approaches 1. Uh, the difference is when you go to negative infinity, you're going to replace the absolute value of x that you get when you factor uh, the x squared out of the radical with the opposite of x. Cancel those x's, you get 3 over negative radical. So when you take the limit, you're going to get negative 3. That's two horizontal asymptotes. This could not be our answer. Um, also, an issue for this is that uh, the denominator is never 0, which means there are no vertical asymptotes. So you have to check both of those things. So this is out. Let's look at the next one. So for the next one, I'm just going to factor. We get this. The problem that this one is going to have is that there are vertical asymptotes at negative 1 half and negative 1. That's two vertical asymptotes. This cannot be our answer. Um, but also, I, like you could take the limit to infinity or negative infinity. You will get the same answer of 1 half. So there is only one horizontal asymptote. So you definitely need to consider positive and negative infinity for horizontal. You need to look for zeros of the denominator that don't cancel out for vertical. Um, so let's check the next one. So here, factor everything. You can actually cancel the x plus 1s. So we get x minus 1 over 2x plus 1 when x is not 
negative one, which means this actually does only have one vertical asymptote at negative one half. Now we gotta see if it has only one horizontal. It's a rational function and it's going to have a horizontal asymptote. So going in both directions, we'll get the same thing, but you should always check infinity and negative infinity. We get one half in this case, again. Uh, this is our answer. Uh, it should be noted, wasn't a part of the question. There's a removable discontinuity or what you might call a hole at x equals negative one, but that wasn't a part of the problem. Um, but we removed the factor of x plus one, right? That's removable discontinuity. This is an answer, but it says uh, check all that apply. So we still have to check the next one. So uh, I'm gonna start off setting the denominator equal to zero. So if we set the denominator equal to zero, we get e to the two x minus one equals zero. So e to the two x is one. Take the natural log of both sides, you get two x is the natural log of one. The natural log of one is zero. So two x is zero or x is zero. So there is a vertical asymptote. Now what we have to do is look at the limit to infinity and negative infinity. So to infinity, I think you can just see, you have one divided by basically infinity. E to the infinity is infinity, so you have one over infinity. Zero for sure. Going to negative infinity is a little bit trickier, maybe. Uh, what I like to do is just think of the graph of e to the 2x. So it looks like this. You can see if you go to negative infinity, e to the 2x is going to zero, which means this limit when you start thinking about it, is one over zero minus one, negative one. So we're actually getting two different horizontal asymptotes. So this would not have been an answer. All right, next up, we want to evaluate the limit as x approaches five from the left of six quantity x minus five over the absolute value of x minus five. This is like one of my favorite graphs, the absolute value of x over x or x over the absolute value of x. I think everybody should know it, it's underappreciated. Here's what this particular one looks like on a very small grid that did not translate very well. Um, you can see like absolute value of x over x is one when x is greater than zero and negative one when x is less than zero. So here we're multiplying by six. So you get six and negative six and we're shifting five units to the right. So this is what we get. You can see if you're just gonna approach this thing from uh, the left, you're definitely gonna get negative six. So that's our answer. A Couple of additional things to think about. Uh, this definitely uh, does not have a limit at x equals five, and it has a jump discontinuity. So I think you should just memorize this. Uh, it's an important graph. Comes up in a couple of contexts, this context, um, as well as definite integrals. So like maybe the integral from four to eight. This is really just counting boxes or rectangles, right? You can draw it you can see those are your two things. The first one is like one by negative six. The second one is three by six. So we just get 12 overall, but a couple of things to think about there. All right, let's look at the next one. So number six, twice differentiable functions, f, g, and h have second derivatives given above. f double prime has an absolute minimum of negative 1.236 at x equals negative 0.078, which I guess will be important. Which of the following functions have exactly two points of inflection? All right, step one, uh, f is the most normal one. And also all the other ones are defined in terms of F. So let's just make a sign chart for F. Uh, I'm sorry, F double prime, I guess I should be saying. So here's our sign chart. I filled in the pluses and minuses. I just did the thing where I plugged in negative a billion uh, and then negative four comes from an even degree thing. So no sign change and all the other ones are odd. So sign change. Okay, we need a sign change in the second derivative to get a point of inflection. So these will be our points of inflection. There are definitely two points of inflection here. Um, for the next one, because it's in terms of f double prime, well, like both of the next two are in terms of f double prime, I need to kind of figure out what f double prime looks at. We're given this piece of information where at x equals negative 0.078, we know the y value of f double prime. So I'm just going to sketch something, right? So uh, this is a positive whatever it is. It's like a positive 12th degree thing. So that's going to start up. And we already know it's positive, right? So it's gonna look basically like a bounce, pass through, go back up. So this is our F double prime. And we know that this one point that we're given is kind of here and um, its ordered pair is that. Now the key to that is that if we move this graph up by one unit, there's still gonna be stuff below the axis, right? Because you're at negative 1.236. If you move it up by one, you're still at negative 0.236. But that bounce is gonna be way up and everything else is way up. So if we make a sign chart for g double prime, that should say, I accidentally wrote g prime, 
Uh, you can see moving it up one unit, we're still gonna have two places where we hit the axis and change sign, two points of inflection. So G double prime is gonna work as well. Uh, we actually have a problem when we do H double prime. So first of all, I should have told you like that the, the relative maximum somewhere between negative four and negative two thirds is like way bigger than one. Um, I think you could figure that out if you like try plugging in negative three or something, but I should have said that in the problem. Uh, if we make the chart for H double prime, it's going to kind of look like this, right? When we, when we move it down, we are now below because that bounce moves down. Um, and then we're still above on that other interval. And then we're like way below. So if you start counting them up, you got one, two, three, four uh, points of inflection. That's not exactly two. So uh, our answer is those two and not that one. It's kind of an interesting problem though. Um, I like it. Let's take a look at the next one. So much reading. All right, puppy weighs 1.5 pounds at birth, 4.5 pounds four months later. So those are two given pieces of information. Uh, the weight of the puppy during its first five months is increasing at a rate proportional to its weight. So this is a differential equation. Uh, how much will the puppy weigh when it is five months old? We're gonna have to use a calculator at the end, but that's okay. So first up, uh, because it's increasing at a rate proportional to its weight, if its weight is called W and the weight is changing over time, that's dW dt is K times W. We need to solve this differential equation, which you should definitely be able to do, so we end up here. W is CE to the KT. We know two pieces of information. So we know that W of zero is 1.5. We also know that uh, W of four is 4.5. So we'll use W of zero to figure out C. So W of zero is 1.5, which means that C is just 1.5. So that takes us to uh, this look, right? We have this. Now we'll use the other one, uh, W of four is 4.5, just plug in, we get this. I'm gonna uh, divide both sides by 1.5, you get this. I'm gonna take the natural log of both sides and divide by four, you get this, which means W of T is this. Also this is a calculator problem, so you could've just used a calculator for a lot of that. We need to plug in five. When we do that, we get 5.922. So think about the givens here, you're given two points on the actual function. Now the reason I'm saying that is the next problem looks almost identical, but is slightly different. So here, puppy weighs 1.5 pounds at birth and is increasing, and its, it, its weight is increasing by 0.64 pounds per month when it is two months old. So that is not a point that's on uh, the function, that's a point on the derivative. If the weight of the puppy during its first five months is increasing to rate proportional, blah, blah, blah. So it's the same basic setup. So we have this, uh, we already know that this is gonna be our solution. We can use this piece of information to solve for C again. Um, we also know increasing by 0.64 pounds, two months old. So that means W prime of two is 0.64. This problem's, uh, I don't know if weird is the right word, but you have to like solve first and then use that second piece of get, uh, given information, right? So we'll figure out that C is 1.5, which means this is what our solution looks like. But to use the second piece of information, we need to find the derivative of what we just figured out, right? Because we need W prime of two is 0.64. So we need uh, DW uh, DT in terms of T, not in terms of W. So let's do that. So W prime is gonna be 1.5 KE to the KT. So this is a slightly different problem. Um, now we'll just use a given information, sub it in. Uh, it's calculator, so there you go. Which means W of T is this weird thing. And then we're asked for W of five, so we get uh, 5.390. So notice the difference between these. It's different given information. The first one, we were given two points on W. The second one, we're given a point on W and a point on W prime. And you have to really read the question and make sure that you understand the difference between them because like obviously the approach is gonna be different. Let's take a look at the next one. So are these true or false? There's like a ton of things like this that you can write up. I just wrote up a bunch of them. Um, so if F is differentiable, then F is continuous. Like, yeah, differentiability implies continuity. So this is definitely true. If F is continuous, then F is differentiable. This is the exact, like, uh, what is this? This is the converse, not the contrapositive. The contrapositive would be if not differentiable, then not continuous, not differentiable, then not continuous is true. This says is continuous, then differentiable. This is false. Classic example, absolute value of X. Make sure you know that example. It's really useful. Um, if f of x is differentiable, then the limit is x approach c of f of x is f of c. 
This is just another way of saying continuous. Um, so this is exactly the same as the first bullet point, so this is also true. If f is differentiable, then limit as x approaches c, f prime of x equals f prime of c. Um, this one, for like very complicated reasons, is false. It's one of the few things in calculus uh, in general, I guess, unless you take like a really detailed analysis, like an honors level real analysis course in college, you're probably never gonna run into this fact other than like you just need to know it. Uh, derivative doesn't need to be continuous um, for complicated reasons. And so uh, this one is false uh, and I don't have a better explanation. I don't even really 100% understand why that's true. Um, I just know that it is true and every time it comes up in a multiple choice, I can get it correct. All right, let's look at the next one. The graphs of f and g are shown above. Find the limit as x approach is one of f of x minus one times g of x plus one. Okay, so I look at this and I just think like, I'm gonna shift my graphs. And you don't really need to shift the whole thing, you just need to shift it like around the point that you're interested in. So the first one, uh, this is a shift of one unit to the right. So let's take the graph of f and just shift it one unit to the right, which will look kind of like that. Doesn't matter mostly what it looks like, just around one, we need it to be accurate. Um, for the second one, that's a shift of one unit to the left, so shift it. So now we can look at the limit from the left and the limit from the right. So the limit as x approaches one from the left of our thing is gonna be, if you look at f uh, approaching one from the left, you get one. If you look at g approaching one from the left, you get negative two, you can see those. Um, and then one times negative two is negative two. Do the same thing from the right. So from the right, you end up with negative one times two. Let's look at that. So from the right, there you go, there you go. Um, so the key here is that you can't just like look at the original given thing and be like, oh, some of these limits don't exist, so the answer overall is gonna be does not exist. That's not a viable way to do it. You just have to kind of shift the graphs, maybe in your head, maybe on paper, um, and then look at the limit from the left and the right and see if they're the same or not the same. So overall, this limit is definitely negative two. Let's take a look at the next one. So remember, these are all things that my students are still kind of getting wrong. It doesn't mean all my students are getting them wrong, but I bet if my students are getting them wrong, a lot of students out there are getting them wrong. So I think this is a useful thing to look at. Um, let f be a continuous function whose average value on the integral from one to five is 12. If, so average value is the integral over interval. If g of x is the integral from one to x of f of t dt, what is the average rate of change of g of x on the interval from one to five? Okay, so uh, let's use the first part and just like figure out what's going on. So the average value is integral over interval. So integral from one to five over five minus one is 12, um, which means that the integral itself is four times 12, or 48. We're gonna keep that because now we have to find uh, average rate of change, which is algebra one slope. So I didn't really think about this problem when I made it. Uh, there's something going on here and I still haven't really thought about it. Uh, but the answer that we get is like, I don't know, I was surprised when I got it. So average, uh, algebra one slope is g of five minus g of one over five minus one. Uh, and now just think like, what's g of five? g of five is the integral from one to five of f of t dt, which we know is 48. Uh, and then minus g of one is the integral from one to one, but the integral from one to one is just zero over five minus one. So this, we know all these values, right? It's um, 48, the thing we found, minus zero divided by four. So we just get back to 12. So clearly there's something going on here that I just didn't think about. I don't know what it is because I still haven't thought about it, um, but kind of interesting. All right, so average value, average rate of change, don't confuse the two. Don't be afraid of these kinds of problems. Just like dive in and do them. Evaluate each of the following. So limits to infinity and negative infinity are like still screwing people up, which is crazy because they're almost like pre-calc ideas. Um, but you know, whatever. So A and B are essentially the same. I'm just gonna rewrite this thing. Uh, so this, I have factored the absolute value of X out of the radical in the denominator. Just factor X squared out of everything in there. And then the square root of X squared is the absolute value of X. So we can rewrite this. If x is greater than zero, the absolute value of x is x. So replace the absolute value of x with x. Cancel out the x, you get this. Um, if x is less than zero, the absolute value of x is the opposite of x. So replace it. Cancel out those x's and you just get negative two over the radical. So once you have it in this form, you can just take the limits to infinity, right? In your head or on paper, depends on. This will definitely be multiple choice if you're asked to do it. Um, so just in your head is fine. If you go to positive infinity, use that top one because x is greater than zero and you're just gonna get two over root three. If you're going to negative infinity, 
use the bottom one because x is definitely less than zero if you're going toward negative infinity. You just get negative two over root three. So that's fine. Um, for part C, uh, I think it's just using properties of natural logs, right? So the natural log of e to the six x is just six x. Uh, because like there's the property of natural log of a to the b is equal to b times the natural log of a, and the natural log of e is just one. Or you could say that e and natural log are inverses. Uh, either way you like to think about that. So the whole thing just becomes the limit as x approaches infinity at 5x over 6x plus 1, and this is definitely 5 over 6. You can use L'Hopital's. You can just look at it however you like to solve that. All good. Uh, we actually have four more of these that we're going to do. So let's take a look. Uh, so we're going to... This is a similar-ish problem, but like different because that plus 3 is inside the natural log. So what I like to do on a problem like this, because it's probably multiple choice, and I probably don't want to think about it very much, I do kind of this informal thing where I say if x is really big or going toward infinity, then our natural log of e to the 2x plus 3 is like basically the same as the natural log of e to the 2x, because what is the plus 3 really doing? And then natural log of e to the 2x is just 2x. So as you approach infinity, the given limit is essentially the same as the limit of 6x over 2x, and 6 over 2 is just 3. That's how I would do that on multiple choice. For the next one, uh, we look at this. I'm going to divide everything I see by e to the 5x. Now, I'm doing that because I know it's going to work, and it like puts it in a form that I can think about. Um, 2 and 1 no longer have e involved at all, so x can do whatever it wants. It's not going to make a difference. 4 and 2 divided by e to the 5x, definitely 0 as you go to infinity, so all that's left is 2 over 1, which makes our answer 2. Um, for f, it's like... A little bit different because you're going to negative infinity. For something like that, I like to think about the limit of e to the 5x to negative infinity. If you're not sure what it is, graph it, right? Clearly you're going to zero. So that means that this limit is essentially just zero plus four over zero plus two, which is two, which then I thought about and I was like, that's kind of weird that you're getting like the same limit, but whatever. Um, here again, if you go to positive infinity, e to the negative 3x, which is just 1 over e to the 3x, is going to go to 0. Um, so you're essentially going to get, uh, well, and then e to the 3x is also going to infinity. So you're kind of just getting 4 divided by infinity for part g. Uh, and 4 divided by infinity is clearly very close to 0. That limit is definitely 0. Let's take a look at the next one. So uh, given the function f shown above, evaluate the integral from negative 2 to 2, f of x dx. I think piecewise functions just scare people sort of in general, and I think sometimes people either over or underthink it. Like on this one, uh, I would just ignore the definition at x equals 1 and do the problem. But if you don't want to do that and you just want to do the same thing every time, just write down three separate integrals, right? If you're going from negative 2 to 2, then you're going to deal with uh, the first thing from negative 2 to 1. You're going to deal with the second thing from 1 to 1, which is weird and just going to give you 0. And then you're going to deal with the third thing from 1 to 2. So, like, this is pretty straightforward. Now you have to deal with each of these things, but, like, not a big deal. First one, fundamental theorem, you get this. Uh, and then for the second one, you're just getting 0. For the third one, you might have to think about the graph. This, again, uh, it's at least the second time I'm talking about it. The graph of this thing, uh, it's... Just absolute value of x over x shifted uh, three units to the left. So it's going to look kind of like this. But we only care about it from 1 to 2. So 1 to 2 is just this rectangle. It's actually a square in this case. Um, just gives us a 1. So then we can just kind of like finish this off. Um, and then that will give us negative 9 halves plus uh, 1, which is negative 7 halves. So don't be afraid of a problem like that. Just dive in. Do it. Uh, not a big deal. It's just, it's like an excuse for you to have to do a bunch of different integrals. Uh, let's look at also a, a jump discontinuity, which I don't know if this is or isn't because I didn't bother to check. You can integrate straight over a jump discontinuity. Uh, in Calc AB, you would never be asked to integrate over a infinite or a infinite discontinuity or a vertical asymptote. Calc BC, you might be asked to do that with an improper integral, so be on the lookout for that. But these are all based on my AB students screwing things up. Um, so let's look at the next one. Using the substitution u equals 2 minus 3x to what integral is the integral from negative 2 to negative 1, x over square root of 2 minus 3x, dx equivalent. All right, so this probably has a bunch of little pitfalls that you can fall into. If u is 2 minus 3x, then I would say that negative 1 third du is dx, 
or you might start with du is negative three dx and then divide by negative three, whatever. Um, I would change the bounds. So if x is negative one, then u is gonna be uh, two plus three, which is five. If x is negative two, then u is two plus six, which is eight, which is weird because the upper bound uh, is now smaller than the lower bound, but that's okay. We'll deal with that after the fact. We also, in this problem, need to substitute for x. So we'll just take this and solve it for x, right? Subtract two uh, and then divide by negative three. So we get x is u minus two over negative three. Make your direct substitutions, right? So for your bounds, like the upper bound goes in the upper spot, the lower goes in the lower. It doesn't matter what the relationship is at this point, we'll fix that. But whatever started on the bottom goes on the bottom, start on the top goes on the top. We need to replace our x which is just this thing. Uh, we need to replace uh, that denominator and the dx. I don't know which I did first. The denominator just becomes a square root of u. And then we need to replace dx. So negative one third and then du. All right, negative one third. And then that negative one third from u minus two over negative three comes out to be uh, one ninth. And then uh, basically everything's the same. And then here, uh, I'm gonna flip the bounds because we don't want the lower bound to be bigger than the upper bound. So it'll become negative one ninth, the integral from five to eight. And then u over the square root of u is u to the one half minus two u to the negative one half and then du. There you go. I'm pretty sure when my students did this, there was like a formatting problem on the question that made them get it wrong. Maybe, potentially, I don't know, I hope so. But um, this is certainly what we would want to do. It's not really hard. Don't forget to change the bounds. Don't forget to sub for dx. Those are like the two biggest mistakes that people make. Let's take a look at another one. Evaluate the derivative of, uh, or d dx, the integral from two to three x squared, natural log of t squared plus three dt. Second fundamental theorem. This is really straightforward. Don't forget the chain rule. Um, so we got to take the upper bound and sub it in everywhere we see a t. So there, basically. So it becomes a natural log of our quantity 3x squared squared plus 3, then don't forget the chain rule. So we're going to multiply by the derivative of the upper bound. So times 6x. And then I guess if it's multiple choice, we got to like work this out. If it's not multiple choice, you could leave that unsimplified, but I think this would definitely be multiple choice. So we get 6x natural log of the quantity 9x to the fourth plus 3. All right, let's take a look at the next one. So Find the particular solution to dy dx equals 15 minus y over four with y of zero equals six. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna rewrite dy dx. So dy dx, I like to factor out the negative. In fact, I kind of refuse to separate with a negative coefficient on y. I will always factor out the negative. It helps you prevent that mistake of not doing u substitution. So here we separate dy over y minus 15. We basically avoided all the problems by doing this. Um, and now we're just going to integrate. So we'll get uh, natural log absolute value of y minus 15. If you didn't factor out the negative, you'd have to have negative natural log of the absolute value of 15 minus y. That's more confusing. Um, then on the right hand side, you would have positive one fourth x plus c. Then you'd have to divide or multiply by a negative before you can exponentiate. I'm going to exponentiate here and I'm going to pull the c down and deal with the like plus or minus from the, rabbit, the absolute value rather. Uh, I have a lot of videos on that. You should definitely get good at this because uh, separable differential equations almost guaranteed to be on the FRQs uh, or multiple choice. Like you're going to see it for sure. Uh, we get this and then we just uh, use our initial condition. So this is true and we get this. So it turns out in this case that C is negative and uh, then we write our answer. So Y is going to be 15 minus nine uh, E to the negative one fourth X so a couple little things there, right? It's uh, factor the negative out before you separate uh, and then uh, take advantage of that like C value to just absorb the plus or minus of the absolute value and you never need to think about it. Let's take a look at one more that I'm just including um, because I notice that my students do this a lot. It's not that they're doing anything. It's that uh, everyone seems to assume that every separable differential equation is going to somehow result in a natural log and that is not the case. So like here, if we separate... Uh, we get this, then when we integrate, we get on the left-hand side, we get one-third y cubed. There's no natural logs. On the right-hand side, we get one-half x squared plus c. Again, no natural logs, but on the x side, you're less likely to think that. Uh, we know that y of one is one. Just sub in, we get this. You get two-six minus three-six is negative one-sixth. 
Uh, we sub that back in. I'm going to multiply three by three to get this. Uh, and then I'm going to take the cube root of both sides, which does not require a plus or minus. We don't have to think about ranges on this. If it was a square root, we would have to think like, because the initial value has a positive y value, we'll choose the positive. If it was a square root and the initial condition had a negative y value, we would choose the negative radical. I probably could have done a better example uh, now that I'm thinking about it. But anyway, these are uh, things that I noticed that my students one week out are still struggling with. Uh, I think it's safe to assume that most calculus students probably are a little shaky with these ideas then. Uh, I hope this was helpful and good luck.